2618, Bruises and Their Treatment. The best application for a bruise, be it large or small, is moist warmth. Therefore, a warm bread and water poultice in hot moist flannels should be put on, as they supple the skin. If the bruise be very severe, and in the neighborhood of a joint, it will be well to apply ten or a dozen leeches over the whole bruised part, and afterwards a poultice. But leeches should not be put on young children. If the bruised part be the knee or the ankle, walking should not be attempted till it can be performed without pain. Inattention to this point often lays the foundation for serious mischief in these joints, especially in the case of scrofulous persons. In all conditions of bruises occurring in children, whether swellings or abrasions, no remedy is so quick or certain of effecting a cure as the pure extract of lead applied to the part. Burns and Scalds 2619 Burns and scalds being essentially the same in all particulars, and differing only in the manner of their production, may be spoken of together. As a general rule, scalds are less severe than burns, because the heat of water, by which scalds are mostly produced, is not, even when it is boiling, so intense as that of flame. Oil, however, and other liquids, whose boiling point is high, produce scalds of a very severe nature. Burns and scalds have been divided into three classes. The first class comprises those where the burn is altogether superficial, and merely reddens the skin, the second, where the injury is greater, and we get little bladders containing a fluid, called serum, dotted over the affected part. In the third class we get, in the case of burns, a charring, and in that of scalds, a softening or pulpiness, perhaps a complete and immediate separation of the part. This may occur at once, or in the course of a little time. The pain from the second kind of burns is much more severe than that in the other two, although the danger, as a general rule, is less than it is in the third class. These injuries are much more dangerous when they take place on the trunk than when they happen on the arms or legs. The danger arises more from the extent of surface that is burnt than from the depth to which the burn goes. This rule, of course, has certain exceptions, because a small burn on the chest or belly penetrating deeply is more dangerous than a more extensive but superficial one on the arm or leg. When a person's clothes are in flames, the best way of extinguishing them is to wind a rug, or some thick material, tightly round the whole of the body. 2620, Treatment of the First Class of Burns and Scalds Of the part affected Cover it immediately with a good coating of common flour, or cotton wool with flour dredged well into it. The great thing is to keep the affected surface of the skin from the contact of the air. The part will shortly get well, and the skin may or may not peel off. Constitutional Treatment If the burn or scald is not extensive, and there is no prostration of strength, this is very simple, and consists in simply giving a little aperient medicine, pills, no. 2. As follows, mix 5 grains of blue pill and the same quantity of compound extract of colocynth, and make into 2 pills, the dose for a full-grown person. 3 hours after the pills give a black draft. If there are general symptoms of fever, such as hot skin, thirst, headache, and k. And k, 2 tablespoonfuls of fever mixture are to be given every 4 hours. The fever mixture, we remind our readers, is made thus, mix a dram of powdered nitro, two drams of carbonate of potash, two teaspoonfuls of antimonial wine, and a tablespoonful of sweet spirits of nitro, in half a pint of water. 2621, Second Class Local Treatment As the symptoms of these kinds of burns are more severe than those of the first class, so the remedies appropriate to them are more powerful. Having, as carefully as possible, Remove the clothes from the burnt surface, and taking care not to break the bladders, spread the following liniment, no. 1. On a piece of linen or lint, not the fluffy side, and apply it to the part, the liniment should be equal parts of lime water and linseed oil, well mixed. If the burn is on the trunk of the body, it is better to use a warm linseed meal poultice. After a few days dress the wound with Turner's serrate. If the burn is at the bend of the elbow, place the arm in the straight position. For if it is bent, the skin, when healed, will be contracted, and the arm, in all probability, 
always remain in the same unnatural position. This, indeed, applies to all parts of the body. Therefore, always place the part affected in the most stretched position possible. Constitutional Treatment The same kind of treatment is to be used as for the first class, only it must be more powerful. Stimulants are move often necessary, but must be given with great caution. If, as is often the case, there is great irritability and restlessness, a dose of opium, paragoric, in doses of from 60 to 100 drops, according to age, is best, is of great service. The feverish symptoms will require aperient medicines and the fever mixture. A drink made of about a tablespoonful of cream of tartar and a little lemon juice, in a quart of warm water, allowed to cool, is a very nice one in these cases. The diet throughout should not be too low, especially if there is much discharge from the wound. After a few days it is often necessary to give wine, ammonia, and strong beef tea. These should be had recourse to when the tongue gets dry and dark, and the pulse weak and frequent. If there should be, after the lapse of a week or two, pain over one particular part of the belly, a blister should be put on it, and a powder of mercury in chalk gray powder. And Dover's powder, two grains of the former and five of the latter, given three times a day. Affections of the head and chest also frequently occur as a consequence of these kinds of burns, but no one who is not a medical man can treat them. 2622, Third Class These are so severe as to make it impossible for a non-professional person to be of much service in attending to them. When they occur, a surgeon should always be sent for. Until he arrives, however, the following treatment should be adopted, place the patient full length on his back, and keep him warm. Apply fomentations of flannels wrung out of boiling water and sprinkled with spirits of turpentine to the part, and give wine and sal volatile in such quantities as the prostration of strength requires. Always bearing in mind the great fact that you have to steer between two quicksands, death from present prostration and death from future excitement, which will always be increased in proportion to the amount of stimulants given. Give, therefore, only just as much as is absolutely necessary to keep life in the body. 2623, Concussion of Brain, Stunning. This may be caused by a blow or a fall. Symptoms. Cold skin, weak pulse, almost total insensibility, slow, weak breathing. Pupil of eye sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, than natural, inability to move, unwillingness to answer when spoken to. These symptoms come on directly after the accident. Treatment Place the patient quietly on a warm bed, send for a surgeon, and do nothing else for the first four or six hours. After this time the skin will become hot, the pulse full, and the patient feverish altogether. If the surgeon has not arrived by the time these symptoms have set in, shave the patient's head, and apply the following lotion, no. 2 mix half an ounce of sal ammoniac, 2 tablespoonfuls of vinegar, and the same quantity of gin or whiskey, in half a pint of water. Then give this pill, number 1. Mix 5 grains of calomel and the same quantity of antimonial powder with a little breadcrumb, and make into 2 pills. Give a black draft 3 hours after the pill, and 2 tablespoonfuls of the above-mentioned fever mixture every 4 hours. Keep on low diet. Leeches are sometimes to be applied to the head. These cases are often followed by violent inflammation of the brain. They can, therefore, only be attended to properly throughout by a surgeon. The great thing for people to do in these cases is, nothing, contenting themselves with putting the patient to bed, and waiting the arrival of a surgeon. 2624, The Cholera and Autumnal Complaints To oppose cholera, there seems no surer or better means than cleanliness, sobriety, and judicious ventilation. Where there is dirt, that is the place for cholera. Where windows and doors are kept most jealously shut, their cholera will find easiest entrance, and people who indulge in intemperate diet during the hot days of autumn are actually courting death. To repeat it, cleanliness, sobriety, and free ventilation almost always defy the pestilence, but, in case of attack, immediate recourse should be had to a physician. The faculty say that a large number of lives have been lost, 
in many seasons, solely from delay in seeking medical assistance. They even assert that, taken early, the cholera is by no means a fatal disorder. The copious use of salt is recommended on very excellent authority. Other autumnal complaints there are, of which diarrhea is the worst example. They come on with pain, flatulence, sickness, with or without vomiting, followed by loss of appetite, general lassitude, and weakness. If attended to at the first appearance, they may soon be conquered. For which purpose it is necessary to assist nature in throwing off the contents of the bowels, which may be won by means of the following prescription, take of calomel three grains, rhubarb eight grains. Mix and take it in a little honey or jelly, and repeat the dose three times, at the intervals of four or five hours. The next purpose to be answered is the defense of the lining membrane of the intestines from their acrid contents, which will be best effected by drinking copiously of linseed tea, or of a drink made by pouring boiling water on quince seeds, which are of a very mucilaginous nature. Or, what is still better, full drafts of whey. If the complaint continue after these means have been employed, some astringent or binding medicine will be required, as the subjoined, take of prepared chalk 2 drams, cinnamon water 7 ounces. Syrup of poppies 1 ounce, mix, and take 3 tablespoonfuls every 4 hours. Should this fail to complete the cure, half a ounce of tincture of catechu, or of kino, may be added to it, and then it will seldom fail. Or a teaspoonful of the tincture of kino alone, with a little water, every three hours, till the diarrhea is checked. While any symptoms of derangement are present, particular attention must be paid to the diet, which should be of a soothing, lubricating, and light nature, as instanced in veal or chicken broth, which should contain but little salt. Rice, batter, and bread puddings will be generally relished, and be eaten with advantage, but the stomach is too much impaired to digest food of a more solid nature. Indeed, we should give that organ, together with the bowels, as little trouble as possible, while they are so incapable of acting in their accustomed manner. Much mischief is frequently produced by the absurd practice of taking tincture of rhubarb, which is almost certain of aggravating that species of disorder of which we have now treated. For it is a spirit as strong as brandy, and cannot fail of producing harm upon a surface which is rendered tender by the formation and contact of vitiated bile. But our last advice is, upon the first appearance of such symptoms as are above detailed, have immediate recourse to a doctor, where possible. 2625, to cure a cold. Put a large teacupful of linseed, with a quarter pound, of sun raisins and two ounces. Of stick licorice, into two quarts of soft water, and let it simmer over a slow fire till reduced to one quart, add to it a quarter pound, of pounded sugar candy, a tablespoonful of old rum, and a tablespoonful of the best white wine vinegar, or lemon juice. The rum and vinegar should be added as the decoction is taken, for, if they are put in at first, the whole soon becomes flat and less efficacious. The dose is half a pint, made warm, on going to bed. And a little may be taken whenever the cough is troublesome. The worst cold is generally cured by this remedy in two or three days, and, if taken in time, is considered infallible. 2626, Cold on the Chest. A flannel dipped in boiling water, and sprinkled with turpentine, laid on the chest as quickly as possible, will relieve the most severe cold or hoarseness. 2627, Substances in the Eye. To remove fine particles of gravel, lime, and k. The eye should be syringed with lukewarm water till free from them. Be particular not to worry the eye, under the impression that the substance is still there, which the enlargement of some of the minute vessels makes the patient believe is actually the case. 2628, Sore Eyes. Incorporate thoroughly, in a glass mortar or vessel, one part of strong citron ointment with three parts of spermaceti ointment. Use the mixture night and morning, by placing a piece of the size of a pea in the corner of the eye affected, only to be used in cases of chronic or long-standing inflammation of the organ, or its lids. 2629, Lime in the Eye Bathe the eye with a little weak vinegar and water, and carefully remove any little piece of lime which may be seen, with a feather. If any lime has got entangled in the eyelashes, 
carefully clear it away with a bit of soft linen soaked in vinegar and water. Violent inflammation is sure to follow. A smart purge must be therefore administered, and in all probability a blister must be applied on the temple, behind the ear, or nape of the neck. 2630, Sty in the Eye Styes are little abscesses which form between the roots of the eyelashes, and are rarely larger than a small pea. The best way to manage them is to bathe them frequently with warm water, or in warm poppy water, if very painful. When they have burst, use an ointment composed of one part of citron ointment and four of spermaceti, well rubbed together, and smear along the edge of the eyelid. Give a grain or two of calomel with five or eight grains of rhubarb, according to the age of the child, twice a week. The old-fashioned and apparently absurd practice of rubbing the sty with a ring, is as good and speedy a cure as that by any process of medicinal application. Though the number of times it is rubbed, or the quality of the ring in direction of the strokes, has nothing to do with its success. The pressure and the friction excite the vessels of the part, and cause an absorption of the effused matter under the eyelash. The edge of the nail will answer as well as a ring. 2631, Inflammation of the Eyelids The following ointment has been found very beneficial in inflammations of the eyeball and edges of the eyelids, take a prepared calomel, one scruple, spermaceti ointment, half a ounce. Mix them well together in a glass mortar. Apply a small quantity to each corner of the eye every night and morning, and also to the edges of the lids, if they are affected. If this should not eventually remove the inflammation, elderflower water may be applied three or four times a day, by means of an eye cup. The bowels should be kept in a laxative state, by taking occasionally a quarter of an ounce of the Cheltenham or Epsom salts. 2632, Fasting. It is said by many able physicians that fasting is a means of removing incipient disease, and of restoring the body to its customary healthy sensations. Howard, the celebrated philanthropist, says a writer, used to fast one day in every week. Napoleon, when he felt his system unstrung, suspended his wanted repast, and took his exercise on horseback. Fitz. 2633. Fits come on so suddenly, often without even the slightest warning, and may prove fatal so quickly, that all people should be acquainted at least with their leading symptoms and treatment, as a few moments, more or less. Will often decide the question between life and death. The treatment, in very many cases at least, to be of the slightest use, should be immediate, as a person in a fit, of apoplexy for instance, may die while a surgeon is being fetched from only the next street. We shall give, as far as the fact of our editing a work for non-professional readers will permit, the peculiar and distinctive symptoms of all kind of fits, and the immediate treatment to be adopted in each case. 2634, Apoplexy. These fits may be divided into two kinds, the strong and the weak. 2635, 1. The strong kind. These cases mostly occur in stout, strong, short-necked, bloated-faced people, who are in the habit of living well. Symptoms The patient may or may not have had headache, sparks before his eyes, with confusion of ideas and giddiness, for a day or two before the attack. When it takes place, he falls down insensible. The body becomes paralyzed, generally more so on one side than the other, the face and head are hot, and the blood vessels about them swollen, the pupils of the eyes are larger than natural and the eyes themselves are fixed. The mouth is mostly drawn down at one corner, the breathing is like loud snoring, the pulse full and hard. Treatment. Place the patient immediately in bed, with his head well raised. Take off everything that he has round his neck, and bleed freely and at once from the arm. If you have not got a lancet, use a penknife or anything suitable that may be at hand. Apply warm mustard poultices to the soles of the feet and the insides of the thighs and legs, put two drops of castor oil, mixed up with eight grains of calomel, on the top of the tongue, as far back as possible. A most important part of the treatment being to open the bowels as quickly and freely as possible. The patient cannot swallow, but these medicines, especially the oil, will be absorbed into the stomach altogether independent of any voluntary action. If possible, 
Throw up a warm turpentine clister, two tablespoonfuls of oil of turpentine in a pint of warm gruel, or, if this cannot be obtained, one composed of about a quart of warm salt and water and soap. Cut off the hair, and apply rags dipped in weak vinegar and water, or weak gin and water, or even simple cold water, to the head. If the blood vessels about the head and neck are much swollen, put from 8 to 10 leeches on the temple opposite to the paralyzed side of the body. Always send for a surgeon immediately, and act according to the above rules, doing more or less, according to the means at hand, and the length of time that must necessarily elapse until he arrives. A pint, or even a quart of blood in a very strong person, may be taken away. When the patient is able to swallow, give him the number one pills, and the number one mixture directly. The no. One pills are made as follows, mix five grains of calomel and the same quantity of antimonial powder with a little breadcrumb, make into two pills, the dose for a full-grown person. For the no. One mixture, dissolve an ounce of Epsom salts in half a pint of senna tea, take a quarter of the mixture as a dose, repeat these remedies if the bowels are not well opened. Keep the patient's head well raised, and cool as above. Give very low diet indeed, gruel, arrowroot, and the like. When a person is recovering, he should have blisters applied to the nape of the neck, his bowels should be kept well open, light diet given, and fatigue, worry, and excess of all kinds avoided. 2636, 2. The weak kind. Symptoms. These attacks are more frequently preceded by warning symptoms than the first kind. The face is pale, the pulse weak, and the body, especially the hands and legs, cold. After a little while, these symptoms sometimes alter to those of the first class in a mild degree. Treatment. At first, if the pulse is very feeble indeed, a little brandy and water or sal volatile must be given. Mustard poultices are to be put, as before, to the soles of the foot and the insides of the thighs and legs. Warm bricks, or bottles filled with warm water, are also to be placed under the armpits. When the strength has returned, the body become warmer, and the pulse fuller and harder, the head should be shaved, and wet rags applied to it, as before described. Leeches should be put, as before, to the temple opposite the side paralyzed. And the bowels should be opened as freely and as quickly as possible. Bleeding from the arm is often necessary in these cases, but a non-professional person should never have recourse to it. Blisters may be applied to the nape of the neck at once. The diet in those cases should not be so low as in the former, indeed, it is often necessary, in a day or so after one of these attacks, to give wine, strong beef tea, and, according to the condition of the patient's strength. 2637. Distinctions between apoplexy and epilepsy. 1. Apoplexy mostly happens in people over 30, whereas epilepsy generally occurs under that ago, at any rate for the first time. A person who has epileptic fits over 30, has generally suffered from them for some years. 2. Again, in apoplexy, the body is paralyzed, and, therefore, has not the convulsions which take place in epilepsy. 3. The peculiar snoring will also distinguish apoplexy from epilepsy. 2638. Distinctions between apoplexy and drunkness. 1. The known habits of the person. 2. The fact of a person who was perfectly sober and sensible a little time before, being found in a state of insensibility. 3. The absence, in apoplexy, of the smell of drink on applying the nose to the mouth. 4. A person in a fit of apoplexy cannot be roused at all, in drunkenness he mostly can, to a certain extent. 2639, Distinction between apoplexy and hysteria. Hysterics mostly happen in young, nervous, unmarried women. And are attended with convulsions, sobbing, laughter, throwing about of the body, and k. And k. 2640, Distinction between apoplexy and poisoning by opium. It is exceedingly difficult to distinguish between these two cases. In poisoning by opium, however, we find the particular smell of the drug in the patient's breath. We should also, in forming our opinion, 
take into consideration the person's previous conduct, whether he has been low and desponding for some time before, or has ever talked about committing suicide. 2641, Epilepsy. Falling Sickness. Those fits mostly happen, at any rate for the first time, to young people, and are more common in boys than girls. They are produced by numerous causes. Symptoms. The fit may be preceded by pains in the head, palpitations, and k. And k. But it mostly happens that the person falls down insensible suddenly, and without any warning whatever. The eyes are distorted, so that only their whites can be seen, there is mostly foaming from the mouth, the fingers are clinched. And the body, especially on one side, is much agitated, the tongue is often thrust out of the mouth. When the fit goes off, the patient feels drowsy and faint, and often sleeps soundly for some time. Treatment During the fit, keep the patient flat on his back, with his head slightly raised, and prevent him from doing any harm to himself, dash cold water into his face, and apply smelling salts to his nose, loosen his shirt collar, and hold a piece of wood about as thick as a finger, the handle of a toothbrush or knife will do as well, between the two rows of teeth, at the back part of the mouth. This will prevent the tongue from being injured. A teaspoonful of common salt thrust into the patient's mouth, during the fit, is of much service. The aftertreatment of these fits is various, and depends entirely upon their causes. A good general rule, however, is always to keep the bowels well open, and the patient quiet, and free from fatigue, worry, and excess of all kinds. 2642, fainting fits are sometimes very dangerous, and at others perfectly harmless. The question of danger depending altogether upon the causes which have produced them, and which are exceedingly various. For instance, fainting produced by disease of the heart is a very serious symptom indeed. Whereas, that arising from some slight cause, such as the sight of blood, and k, need cause no alarm whatever. The symptoms of simple fainting are so well known that it would be quite superfluous to enumerate them here. The treatment consists in laying the patient at full length upon his back, with his head upon a level with the rest of his body, loosening everything about the neck, dashing cold water into the face, and sprinkling vinegar and water about the mouth. Applying smelling salts to the nose, and, when the patient is able to swallow, in giving a little warm brandy and water, or about 20 drops of sal volatile in water. 2643, Hysterics. These fits take place, for the most part, in young, nervous, unmarried women. They happen much less often in married women, and even, in some rare cases indeed, in men. Young women, who are subject to these fits, are apt to think that they are suffering from all the ills that flesh is heir to. And the false symptoms of disease which they show are so like the true ones, that it is often exceedingly difficult to detect the difference. The fits themselves are mostly preceded by great depression of spirits, shedding of tears, sickness, palpitation of the heart, and a pain, as if a nail were being driven in, is also often felt at one particular part of the head. In almost all cases, when a fit is coming on, pain is felt on the left side. This pain rises gradually until it reaches the throat, and then gives the patient a sensation as if she had a pellet there, which prevents her from breathing properly, and, in fact, seems to threaten actual suffocation. The patient now generally becomes insensible, and faints, the body is thrown about in all directions, froth issues from the mouth, incoherent expressions are uttered, and fits of laughter, crying, or screaming, take place. When the fit is going off, the patient mostly cries bitterly, sometimes knowing all, and at others nothing, of what has taken place, and feeling general soreness all over the body. Treatment during the fit Place the body in the same position as for simple fainting, and treat, in other respects, as directed in the article on epilepsy. Always well loosen the patient's stays. And, when she is recovering, and able to swallow, give 20 drops of sal volatile in a little water. The after-treatment of these cases is very various. If the patient is of a strong constitution, she should live on plain diet, take plenty of exercise, and take occasional doses of castor oil, 
or in a period mixture, such as that described as number one, in previous numbers. If, as is mostly the case, the patient is weak and delicate, she will require a different mode of treatment altogether. Good nourishing diet, gentle exercise, cold baths, occasionally a dose of no. 3 myrrh and aloes pills at night, and a dose of compound iron pills twice a day. As to the myrrh and aloes pills, number 3, 10 grains made into 2 pills are a dose for a full-grown person. Of the compound iron pills, no. 4. The dose for a full-grown person is also 10 grains, made into 2 pills. In every case, amusing the mind, and avoiding all causes of overexcitement, are of great service in bringing about a permanent cure. 2644, Liver Complaint and Spasms. A very obliging correspondent recommends the following, from personal experience, take 4 ounces of dried dandelion root, 1 ounce of the best ginger, a quarter ounce of columba root. Braise and boil all together in 3 pints of water till it is reduced to a quart, strain, and take a wine glassful every 4 hours. Our correspondent says it is a safe and simple medicine for both liver complaint and spasms. 2645, Lumbago. A new and successful mode of treating lumbago, advocated by Dyar. Day is a form of counter irritation, said to have been introduced into this country by the late Sir Anthony Carlyle, and which consists in the instantaneous application of a flat iron button, gently heated in a spirit lamp, to the skin. Dyar. Corrigan published, about three years ago, an account of some cases very successfully treated by nearly similar means. Dar. Corrigan's plan was, however, to touch the surface of the part affected, at intervals of half an inch, as lightly and rapidly as possible. Dar. Day has found greater advantages to result from drawing the flat surface of the heated button lightly over the affected part, so as to act on a greater extent of surface. The doctor speaks so enthusiastically of the benefit to be derived from this practice, that it is evidently highly deserving attention. 2646, Palpitation of the Heart Where palpitation occurs as symptomatic of indigestion, the treatment must be directed to remedy that disorder, when it is consequent on a plethoric state, purgatives will be effectual. In this case the patient should abstain from every kind of diet likely to produce a plethoric condition of body. Animal food and fermented liquor must be particularly avoided. Too much indulgence in sleep will also prove injurious. When the attacks arise from nervous irritability, the excitement must be allayed by change of air and a tonic diet. Should the palpitation originate from organic derangement, it must be, of course, beyond domestic management. Luxurious living, indolence, and tight lacing often produce this affection. Such cases are to be conquered with a little resolution. 2647, Poisons shall be the next subject for remark. And we anticipate more detailed instructions for the treatment of persons poisoned, by giving a simple list of the principal poisons, with their antidotes or remedies. Oil of vitriol, backslash. Aquafortis. Magnesia, chalk, soap and water. Spirit of salt, slash. Emetic tartar. Oily drinks, solution of oak bark. Salt of lemons, or chalk, whiting, lime or magnesia, and acid of sugar. Water. Sometimes an emetic. Draft. Pump on back, smelling salts to nose. Prussic acid. Artificial breathing. Chloride of lime to nose. Pearl ash backslash so please backslash smelling salts backslash nitre lemon juice and vinegar and water hartshorn slash sal volatile slash arsenic backslash fly powder or emetics lime water soap and water white arsenic sugar and water oily drinks King's yellow, or, slash. Yellow arsenic, slash. Mercury, backslash. Corrosive sublimit. Whites of eggs, soap and water. Calomel, slash. Opium. 
Emetic draft, vinegar and water. Laudanum. Dashing cold water on. Chest and. Face, walking up and down two or. Three hours. Lead, backslash. White lead. Epsom salts, castor oil, emetics. Sugar of lead, slash. Goulard's extract, slash. Copper. Blue stone. Whites of eggs, sugar and water. Verdigris. Castor oil, gruel. Zinc. Lime water, chalk and water. Soap and water. Iron. Magnesia, warm water. Henbane, backslash. Hemlock. Emetics and castor oil. Nightshade. Brandy and water, if necessary. Foxglove, slash. Poisonous food. Emetics and castor oil. 2648. The symptoms of poisoning may be known for the most part from those of some diseases, which they are very like, from the fact of their coming on immediately after eating or drinking something. Whereas those of disease come on, in most cases at least, by degrees, and with warnings. In most cases where poison is known, or suspected, to have been taken, the first thing to be done is to empty the stomach, well and immediately, by means of mustard mixed in warm water, or plain warm salt and water, or, better, this draft. Which we call no. 1. 20 grains of sulfate of zinc in an ounce and a half of water. This draft to be repeated in a quarter of an hour if vomiting does not ensue. The back part of the throat should be well tickled with a feather, or two of the fingers thrust down it, to induce vomiting. The cases where vomiting must not be used are those where the skin has been taken off, and the parts touched irritated and inflamed by the poison taken, and where the action of vomiting would increase the evil. Full instructions are given in the article on each particular poison as to where emetics are or are not to be given. The best and safest way of emptying the stomach is by means of the stomach pump, as in certain cases the action of vomiting is likely to increase the danger arising from the swollen and congested condition of the blood vessels of the head, which often takes place. In the hands, however, of anyone else than a surgeon, it would be not only useless, but harmful, as a great deal of dexterity, caution, and experience are required to use it properly. After having made these brief introductory remarks, we shall now proceed to particulars. 2649, sulfuric acid, or oil of vitriol, a clear, colorless liquid, of an oily appearance. Symptoms in those who have swallowed it. When much is taken, these come on immediately. There is great burning pain, extending from the mouth to the stomach, vomiting of a liquid of a dark coffee color, often mixed with shreds of flesh and streaks of blood. The skin inside the mouth is taken off, and the exposed surface is at first white, and after a time becomes brownish. There are sometimes spots of a brown color round the lips and on the neck, caused by drops of the acid falling on these parts. There is great difficulty of breathing, owing to the swelling at the back part of the mouth. After a time there is much depression of strength, with a quick, weak pulse, and cold, clammy skin. The face is pale, and has a very anxious look. When the acid swallowed has been greatly diluted in water, the same kind of symptoms occur, only in a milder degree. Treatment Give a mixture of magnesia in milk and water, or, if this cannot be obtained, a finely powdered chalk, or whiting, or even of the plaster torn down from the walls or ceiling, in milk and water. The mixture should be nearly as thick as cream, and plenty of it given. As well as this, simple gruel, milk, or thick flour and water, are very useful, and should be given in large quantities. Violent inflammation of the parts touched by the acid is most likely to take place in the course of a little time, and can only be properly attended to by a surgeon. But if one cannot be obtained, leeches, the fever mixtures, the recipe for which appears repeatedly in previous paragraphs, thick drinks, such as barley water, gruel, arrowroot, and must be had recourse to, according to the symptoms of each particular case and the means at hand. The inflamed condition of the back part of the mouth requires particular attention. 
When the breathing is very labored and difficult in consequence, from 15 to 20 leeches are to be immediately applied to the outside of the throat, and when they drop off, warm poppy fomentations constantly kept to the part. When the pain over the stomach is very great, the same local treatment is necessary, but if it is only slight, a good mustard poultice will be sufficient without the leeches. In all these cases, two tablespoonfuls of the fever mixture should be given every four hours, and only gruel or arrowroot allowed to be eaten for some days. 2650. Nitric acid, commonly known as aqua fortis, or red spirit of nitre, a straw-colored fluid, of the consistence of water, and which gives off dense white fumes on exposure to the air. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it. Much the same as in the case of sulfuric acid. In this case, however, the surface touched by the acid becomes yellowish. The tongue is mostly much swollen. Treatment. The same as for sulfuric acid. 2651. Muriatic acid, spirit of salt, a thin yellow fluid, emitting dense white fumes on exposure to the air. This is not often taken as a poison. The symptoms and treatment are much the same as those of nitric acid. NB. In no case of poisoning by these three acids should emetics ever be given. 2652, oxalic acid, commonly called salt of lemons. This poison may be taken by mistake for Epsom salts, which it is a good deal like. It may be distinguished from them by its very acid taste and its shape, which is that of needle-formed crystals, each of which, if put into a drop of ink, will turn it to a reddish brown, whereas Epsom salts will not change its color at all. When a large dose of this poison has been taken, death takes place very quickly indeed. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it. A hot, burning, acid taste is felt in the act of swallowing, and vomiting of a greenish-brown fluid is produced, sooner or later, according to the quantity and strength of the poison taken. There is great tenderness felt over the stomach, followed by clammy perspirations and convulsions. The legs are often drawn up, and there is generally stupor, from which the patient, however, can easily be roused, and always great prostration of strength. The pulse is small and weak, and the breathing faint. Treatment Chalk or magnesia, made into a cream with water, should be given in large quantities, and afterwards the emetic draft above prescribed, or some mustard and water, if the draft cannot be got. The back part of the throat to be tickled with a feather, to induce vomiting. Arrowroot, gruel, and the like drinks, are to be taken. When the prostration of strength is very great and the body cold, warmth is to be applied to it, and a little brandy and water, or sal volatile and water, given. 2653. Prussic acid, a thin, transparent, and colorless liquid, with a peculiar smell, which greatly resembles that of bitter almonds. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it. These come on immediately after the poison has been taken, and may be produced by merely smelling it. The patient becomes perfectly insensible, and falls down in convulsions, his eyes are fixed and staring, the pupils being bigger than natural, the skin is cold and clammy, the pulse scarcely perceptible, and the breathing slow and gasping. Treatment Very little can be done in these cases, as death takes place so quickly after the poison has been swallowed, when it takes place at all. The best treatment, which should always be adopted in all cases, even though the patient appears quite dead is to dash quantities of cold water on the back, from the top of the neck downwards. Placing the patient under a pump, and pumping on him, is the best way of doing this. Smelling salts are also to be applied to the nose, and the chest well rubbed with a camphor liniment. 2654. Alkalis, potash, soda, and ammonia, or common smelling salts, with their principal preparations, pearl ash, soap lees, liquor potassi, nitre, sal prunella, hartshorn, and sal, volatile. Alkalis are seldom taken or given with the view of destroying life. They may, however, be swallowed by mistake. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed them. There is at first a burning, acrid taste in, and a sensation of tightness round, the throat, like that of strangling, the skin touched is destroyed, 
retching mostly followed by actual vomiting, then sets in. The vomited matters often containing blood of a dark brown color, with little shreds of flesh here and there, and always changing vegetable blue colors green. There is now great tenderness over the whole of the belly. After a little while, great weakness, with cold, clammy sweats, a quick weak pulse, and purging of bloody matters, takes place. The brain, too, mostly becomes affected. Treatment Give two tablespoonfuls of vinegar or lemon juice in a glassful of water every few minutes until the burning sensation is relieved. Any kind of oil or milk may also be given, and will form soap when mixed with the poison in the stomach. Barley water, gruel, arrowroot, linseed tea, and are also very useful, and should be taken constantly, and in large quantities. If inflammation should take place, it is to be treated by applying leeches and warm poppy fomentations to the part where the pain is most felt, and giving two tablespoonfuls of the fever mixture every four hours. The diet in all these cases should only consist of arrowroot or gruel for the first few days, and then of weak broth or beef tea for some time after. 2655. When very strong fumes of smelling salts have in any way been inhaled, there is great difficulty of breathing, and alarming pain in the mouth and nostrils. In this case let the patient inhale the steam of warm vinegar, and treat the feverish symptoms as before. 2656. Arsenic. Mostly seen under the form of white arsenic, or fly powder, and yellow arsenic, or king's yellow. Symptoms produced in those who have swallowed it. These vary very much, according to the form and dose in which the poison has been taken. There is faintness, depression, and sickness, with an intense burning pain in the region of the stomach, which gets worse and worse, and is increased by pressure. There is also vomiting of dark brown matter, sometimes mixed with blood. And mostly great thirst, with a feeling of tightness round, and of burning in, the throat. Purging also takes place, the matters brought away being mixed with blood. The pulse is small and irregular, and the skin sometimes cold and clammy, and at others hot. The breathing is painful. Convulsions and spasms often occur. Treatment Give a couple of teaspoonfuls of mustard in a glass of water, to bring on or assist vomiting, and also use the other means elsewhere recommended for the purpose. A solution, half of lime water and half of linseed oil, well mixed, may be given, as well as plenty of arrowroot, gruel, or linseed tea. Simple milk is also useful. A little castor oil should be given, to cleanse the intestines of all the poison, and the after symptoms treated on general principles. 2657, Corrosive Sublimate. Mostly seen in the form of little heavy crystalline masses, which melt in water, and have a metallic taste. It is sometimes seen in powder. This is a most powerful poison. Symptoms. These mostly come on immediately after the poison has been taken. There is a coppery taste experienced in the act of swallowing, with a burning heat, extending from the top of the throat down to the stomach, and also a feeling of great tightness round the throat. In a few minutes great pain is felt over the region of the stomach, and frequent vomiting of long, stringy white masses, mixed with blood, takes place. There is also mostly great purging. The countenance is generally pale and anxious. The pulse always small and frequent, the skin cold and clammy, and the breathing difficult. Convulsions and insensibility often occur, and are very bad symptoms indeed. The inside of the mouth is more or less swollen. Treatment Mix the whites of a dozen eggs in two pints of cold water, and give a glassful of the mixture every three or four minutes, until the stomach can contain no more. If vomiting does not now come on naturally, and supposing the mouth is not very sore or much swollen, an emetic draft, number one, may be given, and vomiting induced. The no. One draft, we remind our readers, is thus made, 20 grains of sulfate of zinc in an ounce and a half of water, the draft to be repeated if vomiting does not take place in a quarter of an hour. After the stomach has been well cleaned out, milk, flour and water, linseed tea, or barley water, should be taken in large quantities. If eggs cannot be obtained, milk, or flour and water, 
should be given as a substitute for them at once. When the depression of strength is very great indeed, a little warm brandy and water must be given. In the course of an hour or two the patient should take two tablespoonfuls of castor oil, and if inflammation comes on, it is to be treated as directed in the article on acids and alkalis. The diet should also be the same. If the patient recovers, great soreness of the gums is almost certain to take place. The simplest, and at the same time one of the best modes of treatment, is to wash them well three or four times a day with brandy and water. 2658, Calomel. A heavy white powder, without taste, and insoluble in water. It has been occasionally known to destroy life. Symptoms. Much the same as in the case of corrosive sublimate. Treatment. The same as for corrosive sublimate. If the gums are sore, wash them, as recommended in the case of corrosive sublimate, with brandy and water three or four times a day, and keep the patient on fluids, such as arrowroot, gruel, broth, or beef tea, according to the other symptoms. Eating hard substances would make the gums more sore and tender. 2659, Copper. The preparations of this metal which are most likely to be the ones producing poisonous symptoms, are blue stone and verdigris. People are often taken ill after eating food that has been cooked in copper saucepans. When anything has been cooked in one of these vessels, it should never be allowed to cool in it. Symptoms Headache, pain in the stomach, and purging. Vomiting of green or blue matters, convulsions, and spasms. Treatment Give whites of eggs, sugar and water, castor oil, and drinks, such as arrowroot and gruel. 2660, Emetic Tartar. Seen in the form of a white powder, or crystals, with a slightly metallic taste. It has not often been known to destroy life. Symptoms. A strong metallic taste in the act of swallowing, followed by a burning pain in the region of the stomach, vomiting, and great purging. The pulse is small and rapid, the skin cold and clammy, the breathing difficult and painful, and the limbs often much cramped. There is also great prostration of strength. Treatment Promote the vomiting by giving plenty of warm water, or warm arrowroot and water. Strong tea, in large quantities, should be drunk, or, if it can be obtained, a decoction of oak bark. The aftertreatment is the same as that for acids and alkalis. The principal object in all these cases being to keep down the inflammation of the parts touched by the poison by means of leeches, warm poppy fomentations, fever mixtures, and very low diet. 2661. Lead, and its preparations, sugar of lead, Goulard's extract, white lead. Lead is by no means an active poison, although it is popularly considered to be so. It mostly affects people by being taken into the system slowly, as in the case of painters and glaciers. A newly painted house, too, often affects those living in it. Symptoms produced when taken in a large dose. There is at first a burning, pricking sensation in the throat, to which thirst, giddiness, and vomiting follow. The belly is tight, swollen, and painful, the pain being relieved by pressure. The bowels are mostly bound. There is great depression of strength, and a cold skin. Treatment Give an emetic draft, number 1, see above, at once, and shortly afterwards a solution of Epsom salts in large quantities. A little brandy and water must be taken if the depression of strength is very great indeed. Milk, whites of eggs, and arrowroot are also useful. After two or three hours, Cleanse the stomach and intestines well out with two tablespoonfuls of castor oil, and treat the symptoms which follow according to the rules laid down in other parts of these articles. Symptoms when it is taken into the body slowly. Headache, pain about the navel, loss of appetite and flesh, offensive breath, a blueness of the edges of the gums, the belly is tight, hard, and knotty, and the pulse slow and languid. There is also sometimes a difficulty in swallowing. Treatment. Give five grains of calomel and half a grain of opium directly, in the form of a pill, and half an ounce of Epsom salts in two hours, and repeat this treatment until the bowels are well opened. 
put the patient into a warm bath, and throw up a clister of warmish water when he is in it. Fomentations of warm oil of turpentine, if they can be obtained, should be put over the whole of the belly. The great object is to open the bowels as freely and as quickly as possible. When this has been done, a grain of pure opium may be given. Arrowroot or gruel should be taken in good large quantities. The after-treatment must depend altogether upon the symptoms of each particular case. 2662, Opium, and its preparations, Laudanum, and K. Solid opium is mostly seen in the form of rich brown flattish cakes, with little pieces of leaves sticking on them here and there, and a bitter and slightly warm taste. The most common form in which it is taken as a poison, is that of laudanum. Symptoms These consist at first in giddiness and stupor, followed by insensibility, the patient, however, being roused to consciousness by a great noise, so as to be able to answer a question, but becoming insensible again almost immediately. The pulse is now quick and small, the breathing hurried, and the skin warm and covered with perspiration. After a little time, these symptoms change. The person becomes perfectly insensible, the breathing slow and snoring, as in apoplexy, the skin cold, and the pulse slow and full. The pupil of the eye is mostly smaller than natural. On applying his nose to the patient's mouth, a person may smell the poison very distinctly. Treatment Give an emetic draft, number 1, see above, directly, with large quantities of warm mustard and water, warm salt and water, or simple warm water. Tickle the top of the throat with a feather, or put two fingers down it to bring on vomiting, which rarely takes place of itself. Dash cold water on the head, chest, and spine, and flap these parts well with the ends of wet towels. Give strong coffee or tea. Walk the patient up and down in the open air for two or three hours, the great thing being to keep him from sleeping. Electricity is of much service. When the patient is recovering, mustard poultices should be applied to the soles of the feet and the insides of the thighs and legs. The head should be kept cool and raised. 2663. The following preparations, which are constantly given to children by their nurses and mothers, for the purpose of making them sleep, often prove fatal, syrup of poppies, and Godfrey's cordial. The author would most earnestly urge all people caring for their children's lives, never to allow any of these preparations to be given, unless ordered by a surgeon. 2664. The treatment in the case of poisoning by henbane, hemlock, nightshade, and foxglove, is much the same as that for opium. Vomiting should be brought on in all of them. 2665, Poisonous Food It sometimes happens that things which are in daily use, and mostly perfectly harmless, give rise, under certain unknown circumstances, and in certain individuals, to the symptoms of poisoning. The most common articles of food of this description are mussels, salmon, and certain kinds of cheese and bacon. The general symptoms are thirst, weight about the stomach, difficulty of breathing, vomiting, purging, spasms, prostration of strength, and, in the case of muscles more particularly, an eruption on the body, like that of nettle rash. Treatment Empty the stomach well with number one draft and warm water, and give two tablespoonfuls of castor oil immediately after. Let the patient take plenty of arrowroot, gruel, and the like drinks, and if there is much depression of strength, give a little warm brandy and water. Should symptoms of fever or inflammation follow, they must be treated as directed in the articles on other kinds of poisoning. 2666, mushrooms, and similar kinds of vegetables, often produce poisonous effects. The symptoms are various, sometimes giddiness and stupor, and at others pain in and swelling of the belly, with vomiting and purging, being the leading ones. When the symptoms come on quickly after taking the poison, it is generally the head that is affected. The treatment consists in bringing on vomiting in the usual manner, as quickly and as freely as possible. The other symptoms are to be treated on general principles, if they are those of depression, by brandy and water or sal volatile, if those of inflammation, by leeches, fomentations, fever mixtures, and k. And k. 2667 for cure of ringworm.
Take of subcarbonate of soda 1 dram, which dissolve in 1 half pint of vinegar. Wash the head every morning with soft soap, and apply the lotion night and morning. 1 teaspoonful of sulfur and treacle should also be given occasionally night and morning. The hair should be cut close, and round the spot it should be shaved off, and the part, night and morning, bathed with a lotion made by dissolving a dram of white vitriol in 8 ounces of water. A small piece of either of the two subjoined ointments rubbed into the part when the lotion has dried in. No, 1. Take of citron ointment 1 dram, sulfur and tar ointment, of each half a ounce, mix thoroughly, and apply twice a day. Number 2. Take of simple cerate 1 ounce, creosote 1 dram, calomel 30 grains, mix and use in the same manner as the first. Concurrent with these external remedies, the child should take an alterative powder every morning, or, if they act too much on the bowels, only every second day. The following will be found to answer all the intentions desired. 2668. Alterative powders for ringworm. Take of. Sulfuret of antimony, precipitated. 24 grains. Gray powder. 12 grains. Calomel. 6 grains. Jalap powder. 36 grains. Mix carefully, and divide into 12 powders for a child from 1 to 2 years old, into 9 powders for a child from 2 to 4 years, and into 6 powders for a child from 4 to 6 years. Where the patient is older, the strength may be increased by enlarging the quantities of the drugs ordered, or by giving one and a half or two powders for one dose. The ointment is to be well washed off every morning with soap and water, and the part bathed with the lotion before reapplying the ointment. An imperative fact must be remembered by mother or nurse, never to use the same comb employed for the child with ringworm, for the healthy children, or let the affected little one sleep with those free from the disease. And, for fear of any contact by hands or otherwise, to keep the child's head enveloped in a nightcap, till this eruption is completely cured. 2669. Scratches. Trifling as scratches often seem, they ought never to be neglected, but should be covered and protected, and kept clean and dry until they have completely healed. If there is the least appearance of inflammation, no time should be lost in applying a large bread and water poultice, or hot flannels repeatedly applied, or even leeches in good numbers may be put on at some distance from each other. 2670. For shortness of breath, or difficult breathing. Vitriolated spirits of ether 1 ounce, camphor 12 grains, make a solution, of which take a teaspoonful during the paroxysm. This is found to afford instantaneous relief in difficulty of breathing, depending on internal diseases and other causes, where the patient, from a very quick and laborious breathing, is obliged to be in an erect posture. 2671. Sprains. A sprain is a stretching of the leaders or ligaments of a part through some violence, such as slipping, falling on the hands, pulling a limb, and k. And k. The most common are those of the ankle and wrist. These accidents are more serious than people generally suppose, and often more difficult to cure than a broken log or arm. The first thing to be done is to place the sprained part in the straight position, and to raise it a little as well. Some recommend the application of cold lotions at first. The editress, however, is quite convinced that warm applications are, in most cases, the best for for the first three or four days. These fomentations are to be applied in the following manner, dip a good-sized piece of flannel into a pail or basin full of hot water or hot poppy fomentation, six poppy heads boiled in one quart of water for about a quarter of an hour. Ring it almost dry, and apply it, as hot as the patient can bear, right round the sprained part. Then place another piece of flannel, quite dry, over it, in order that the steam and warmth may not escape. This process should be repeated as often as the patient feels that the flannel next to his skin is getting cold, the oftener the better. The bowels should be opened with a black draft, and the patient kept on low diet. If he has been a great drinker, he may be allowed to take a little beer, but it is better not to do so. A little of the cream of tartar drink, ordered in the case of burns, may be taken occasionally if there is much thirst. 
When the swelling and tenderness about the joint are very great, from 8 to 12 leeches may be applied. When the knee is the joint affected, the greatest pain is felt at the inside, and therefore the greater quantity of the leeches should be applied to that part. When the shoulder is sprained, the arm should be kept close to the body by means of a linen roller, which is to be taken four or five times round the whole of the chest. It should also be brought two or three times underneath the elbow, in order to raise the shoulder. This is the best treatment for these accidents during the first three or four days. After that time, supposing that no unfavorable symptoms have taken place, a cold lotion, composed of a tablespoonful of sal ammoniac to a quart of water, or vinegar and water, should be constantly applied. This lotion will strengthen the part, and also help in taking away any thickening that may have formed about the joint. In the course of two or three weeks, according to circumstances, the joint is to be rubbed twice a day with flannel dipped in opodeldoc, a flannel bandage rolled tightly round the joint, the pressure being greatest at the lowest part. And the patient allowed to walk about with the assistance of a crutch or stick. He should also occasionally, when sitting or lying down, quietly bend the joint backwards and forwards, to cause its natural motion to return, and to prevent stiffness from taking place. When the swelling is very great immediately after the accident has occurred, from the breaking of the blood vessels, it is best to apply cold applications at first. If it can be procured, oil silk may be put over the warm fomentation flannel, instead of the dry piece of flannel. Old flannel is better than new. 2672, Cure for Stammering Where there is no malformation of the organs of articulation, stammering may be remedied by reading aloud with the teeth closed. This should be practiced for two hours a day, for three or four months. The advocate of this simple remedy says, I can speak with certainty of its utility. 2673, Stammering At a recent meeting of the Boston Society of Natural History, Dr. Warren stated, a simple, easy, and effectual cure of stammering. It is, simply, at every syllable pronounced, to tap at the same time with the finger. By so doing, the most inveterate stammerer will be surprised to find that he can pronounce quite fluently, and, by long and constant practice, he will pronounce perfectly well. 2674. Suffocation, Apparent. Suffocation may arise from many different causes. Anything which prevents the air getting into the lungs will produce it. We shall give the principal causes, and the treatment to be followed in each case. 2675, 1. Carbonic acid gas. Choke damp of mines. This poisonous gas is met with in rooms where charcoal is burnt, and where there is not sufficient draft to allow it to escape. In coal pits, near lime kills, in breweries, and in rooms and houses where a great many people live huddled together in wretchedness and filth, and where the air in consequence becomes poisoned. This gas gives out no smell, so that we cannot know of its presence. A candle will not burn in a room which contains much of it. Effects At first there is giddiness, and a great wish to sleep. After a little time, or where there is much of it present, a person feels great weight in the head, and stupid, gets by degrees quite unable to move, and snores as if in a deep sleep. The limbs may or may not be stiff. The heat of the body remains much the same at first. Treatment Remove the person affected into the open air, and, even though it is cold weather, take off his clothes. Then lay him on his back, with his head slightly raised. Having done this, dash vinegar and water over the whole of the body, and rub it hard, especially the face and chest, with towels dipped in the same mixture. The hands and feet also should be rubbed with a hard brush. Apply smelling salts to the nose, which may be tickled with a feather. Dashing cold water down the middle of the back is of great service. If the person can swallow, give him a little lemon water, or vinegar and water to drink. The principal means, however, to be employed in this, as, in fact, in most cases of apparent suffocation, is what is called artificial breathing. This operation should be performed by three persons, and in the following manner, the first person should put the nozzle of a common pair of bellows into one of the patient's nostrils. The second should push down, and then thrust back, that part of the throat called Adam's apple, 
and the third should first raise and then depress the chest, one hand being placed over each side of the ribs. These three actions should be performed in the following order, first of all, the throat should be drawn down and thrust back, then the chest should be raised, and the bellows gently blown into the nostril. Directly this is done, the chest should be depressed, so as to imitate common breathing. This process should be repeated about 18 times a minute. The mouth and the other nostril should be closed while the bellows are being blown. Persevere, if necessary, with this treatment for 7 or 8 hours, in fact, till absolute signs of death are visible. Many lives are lost by giving it up too quickly. When the patient becomes roused, he is to be put into a warm bed, and a little brandy and water, or twenty drops of sal volatile, given cautiously now and then. This treatment is to be adopted in all cases where people are affected from breathing bad air, smells, and k. And k. 2676, 2. Drowning. This is one of the most frequent causes of death by suffocation. Treatment. Many methods have been adopted, and as some of them are not only useless, but hurtful, we will mention them here, merely in order that they may be avoided. In the first place, then, never hang a person up by his heels, as it is an error to suppose that water gets into the lungs. Hanging a person up by his heels would be quite as bad as hanging him up by his neck. It is also a mistake to suppose that rubbing the body with salt and water is of service. Proper Treatment Directly a person has been taken out of the water, he should be wiped dry and wrapped in blankets. But if these cannot be obtained, the clothes of the bystanders must be used for the purpose. His head being slightly raised, and any water, weeds, or froth that may happen to be in his mouth, having been removed, he should be carried as quickly as possible to the nearest house. He should now be put into a warm bath, about as hot as the hand can pleasantly bear, and kept there for about ten minutes, artificial breathing being had recourse to while he is in it. Having been taken out of the bath, he should be placed flat on his back, with his head slightly raised, upon a warm bed in a warm room, wiped perfectly dry, and then rubbed constantly all over the body with warm flannels. At the same time, mustard poultices should be put to the soles of the feet, the palms of the hands, and the inner surface of the thighs and legs. Warm bricks, or bottles filled with warm water, should be placed under the armpits. The nose should be tickled with a feather, and smelling salts applied to it. This treatment should be adopted while the bath is being got ready, as well as when the body has been taken out of it. The bath is not absolutely necessary. Constantly rubbing the body with flannels in a warm room having been found sufficient for resuscitation. Serbi Brody says that warm air is quite as good as warm water. When symptoms of returning consciousness begin to show themselves, give a little wine, brandy, or twenty drops of sal volatile and water. In some cases it is necessary, in about twelve or twenty-four hours after the patient has revived, to bleed him, for peculiar head symptoms which now and then occur. Bleeding, however, even in the hands of professional men themselves, should be very cautiously used, non-professional ones should never think of it. The best thing to do in these cases is to keep the head well raised, and cool with a lotion such as that recommended above for sprains. To administer an aperient draft, and to abstain from giving anything that stimulates, such as wine, brandy, sal volatile, and k. And k. As a general rule, a person dies in three minutes and a half after he has been underwater. It is difficult, however, to tell how long he has actually been under it, although we may know well exactly how long he has been in it. This being the case, always persevere in your attempts at resuscitation until actual signs of death have shown themselves, even for six, eight, or ten hours. Dar. Douglas, of Glasgow, resuscitated a person who had been underwater for fourteen minutes, by simply rubbing the whole of his body with warm flannels, in a warm room, for eight hours and a half. At the end of which time the person began to show the first symptoms of returning animation. Should the accident occur at a great distance from any house, this treatment should be adopted as closely as the circumstances will permit of. Breathing through any tube, such as a piece of card or paper rolled into the form of a pipe, will do as a substitute for the bellows. 
To recapitulate, rub the body dry, take matters out of mouth, cover with blankets or clothes. Slightly raise the head, and place the body in a warm bath, or on a bed in a warm room, apply smelling salts to nose, employ artificial breathing, rub well with warm flannels. Put mustard poultices to feet, hands, and insides of thighs and legs, with warm bricks or bottles to armpits. Don't bleed. Give wine, brandy, or sal volatile when recovering, and persevere till actual signs of death are seen. 2677. Briefly to conclude what we have to say of suffocation, let us treat of lightning. When a person has been struck by lightning, there is a general paleness of the whole body, with the exception of the part struck, which is often blackened, or even scorched. Treatment. Same as for drowning. It is not, however, of much use. For when death takes place at all, it is generally instantaneous. 2678, Cure for the Toothache. Take a piece of sheet zinc, about the size of a sixpence, and a piece of silver, say a shilling. Place them together, and hold the defective tooth between them or contiguous to them, in a few minutes the pain will be gone, as if by magic. The zinc and silver, acting as a galvanic battery, will produce on the nerves of the tooth sufficient electricity to establish a current, and consequently to relieve the pain. Or smoke a pipe of tobacco and caraway seeds. Again. 2679. A small piece of the pellitory root will, by the flow of saliva it causes, afford relief. Creosote, or a few drops of tincture of myrrh, or friar's balsam, on cotton, put on the tooth, will often subdue the pain. A small piece of camphor, however, retained in the mouth, is the most reliable and likely means of conquering the paroxysms of this dreaded enemy. 2680, Warts. Eisenberg says, in his, Advice on the Hand, that the hydrochlorate of lime is the most certain means of destroying warts. The process, however, is very slow, and demands perseverance, for, if discontinued before the proper time, no advantage is gained. The following is a simple cure, on breaking the stalk of the crowfoot plant in two, a drop of milky juice will be observed to hang on the upper part of the stem. If this be allowed to drop on a wart, so that it be well saturated with the juice, in about three or four dressings the warts will die, and may be taken off with the fingers. They may be removed by the above means from the teats of cows, where they are sometimes very troublesome, and prevent them standing quiet to be milked. The wart touched lightly every second day with lunar caustic, or rubbed every night with blue stone, for a few weeks, will destroy the largest wart, wherever situated. 2681 to cure a whitlow. As soon as the whitlow has risen distinctly, a pretty large piece should be snipped out, so that the watery matter may readily escape, and continue to flow out as fast as produced. A bread and water poultice should be put on for a few days, when the wound should be bound up lightly with some mild ointment, when a cure will be speedily completed. Constant poulticing both before and after the opening of the whitlow, is the only practice needed, but as the matter lies deep, when it is necessary to open the abscess, the incision must be made deep to reach the suppuration. 2682, Wounds. There are several kinds of wounds, which are called by different names, according to their appearance, or the manner in which they are produced. As, however, it would be useless, and even hurtful, to bother the reader's head with too many nice professional distinctions, we shall content ourselves with dividing wounds into three classes. 2683, 1. Incised wounds or cuts, those produced by a knife, or some sharp instrument. 2684, 2. Lacerated, or torn wounds, those produced by the claws of an animal, the bite of a dog, running quickly against some projecting blunt object, such as a nail, and. 2685, 3. Punctured or penetrating wounds, those produced by anything running deeply into the flesh, such as a sword, a sharp nail, a spike, the point of a bayonet, and. 2686, Class 1. Incised wounds or cuts. The danger arising from these accidents is owing more to their position than to their extent. Thus, a cut of half an inch long, 
which goes through an artery, is more serious than a cut of two inches long, which is not near one. Again, a small cut on the head is more often followed by dangerous symptoms than a much larger one on the legs. Treatment If the cut is not a very large one, and no artery or vein is wounded, this is very simple. If there are any foreign substances left in the wound, they must be taken out, and the bleeding must be quite stopped before the wound is strapped up. If the bleeding is not very great, it may easily be stopped by raising the cut part, and applying rags dipped in cold water to it. All clots of blood must be carefully removed, for, if they are left behind, they prevent the wound from healing. When the bleeding has been stopped, and the wound perfectly cleaned, its two edges are to be brought closely together by thin straps of common adhesive plaster, which should remain on, if there is not great pain or heat about the part. For two or three days, without being removed. The cut part should be kept raised and cool. When the strips of plaster are to be taken off, they should first be well bathed with lukewarm water. This will cause them to come away easily, and without opening the lips of the wound. Which accident is very likely to take place, if they are pulled off without having been first moistened with the warm water. If the wound is not healed when the strips of plaster are taken off, fresh ones must be applied. Great care is required in treating cuts of the head, as they are often followed by erysipelas taking place round them. They should be strapped with isinglass plaster, which is much less irritating than the ordinary adhesive plaster. Only use as many strips as are actually requisite to keep the two edges of the wound together, keep the patient quite quiet, on low diet, for a week or so, according to his symptoms. Purge him well with the no. Two pills, five grains of blue pill mixed with the same quantity of compound extract of colocynth, make into two pills, the dose for an adult. If the patient is feverish, give him two tablespoonfuls of the fever mixture three times a day. The fever mixture, we remind our readers, is thus made, mix a dram of powdered nitre, two drams of carbonate of potash, two teaspoonfuls of antimonial wine, and a tablespoonful of sweet spirits of nitre in half a pint of water. A person should be very careful of himself for a month or two after having had a bad cut on the head. His bowels should be kept constantly open, and all excitement and excess avoided. When a vein or artery is wounded, the danger is, of course, much greater. Those accidents, therefore, should always be attended to by a surgeon, if he can possibly be procured. Before he arrives, however, or in case his assistance cannot be obtained at all, the following treatment should be adopted, raise the cut part, and press rags dipped in cold water firmly against it. This will often be sufficient to stop the bleeding, if the divided artery or vein is not dangerous. When an artery is divided, the blood is of a bright red color, and comes away in jets. In this case, and supposing the leg or arm to be the cut part, a handkerchief is to be tied tightly round the limb above the cut, and, if possible, the two bleeding ends of the artery should each be tied with a piece of silk. If the bleeding is from a vein, the blood is much darker, and does not come away in jets. In this case, the handkerchief is to be tied below the cut, and a pad of lint or linen pressed firmly against the divided ends of the vein. Let every bad cut, especially where there is much bleeding, and even although it may to all appearance have been stopped, be attended to by a surgeon, if one can by any means be obtained. 2687, Class 2. Lacerated or torn wounds. There is not so much bleeding in these cases as in clean cuts, because the blood vessels are torn across in a zigzag manner, and not divided straight across. In other respects, however, they are more serious than ordinary cuts, being often followed by inflammation, mortification, fever, and in some cases by locked jaw. Foreign substances are also more likely to remain in them. Treatment Stop the bleeding, if there is any, in the manner directed for cuts, remove all substances that may be in the wound, keep the patient quite quiet, and on low diet, gruel, arrowroot, and the like, purge with the number one pills and the number one mixture. The number one pill, mix five grains of calomel and the same quantity of antimonial powder, with a little bread crumb, and make into two pills, which is the dose for an adult. The number one mixture, 
dissolve an ounce of Epsom salts in half a pint of senna tea. A quarter of the mixture is a dose. If there are feverish symptoms, give two tablespoonfuls of fever mixture, see above, every four hours. If possible, bring the two edges of the wound together, but do not strain the parts to do this. If they cannot be brought together, on account of a piece of flesh being taken clean out, or the raggedness of their edges, put lint dipped in cold water over the wound, and cover it with oiled silk. It will then fill up from the bottom. If the wound, after being well washed, should still contain any sand, or grit of any kind, or if it should get red and hot from inflammation, a large warm bread poultice will be the best thing to apply until it becomes quite clean. Or the inflammation goes down. When the wound is a very large one, the application of warm poppy fomentations is better than that of the lint dipped in cold water. If the redness and pain about the part, and the general feverish symptoms, are great, from 8 to 12 leeches are to be applied round the wound, and a warm poppy fomentation or warm bread poultice applied after they drop off. 2688, Class 3. Punctured or Penetrating Wounds. These, for many reasons, are the most serious of all kinds of wounds. Treatment. The same as that for lacerated wounds. Pus, matter, often forms at the bottom of these wounds, which should, therefore, be kept open at the top, by separating their edges every morning with a bodkin, and applying a warm bread poultice immediately afterwards. They will then, in all probability, heal up from the bottom, and any matter which may form will find its own way out into the poultice. Sometimes, however, in spite of all precautions, collections of matter, abscesses, will form at the bottom or sides of the wound. Those are to be opened with a lancet, and the matter thus let out. When matter is forming, the patient has cold shiverings, throbbing pain in the part, and flushes on the face, which come and go. A swelling of the part is also often seen. The matter in the abscesses may be felt to move backwards and forwards, when pressure is made from one side of the swelling to the other with the first and second fingers, the middle and that next the thumb, of each hand. Medical Memoranda 2689 Advantages of cleanliness. Health and strength cannot be long continued unless the skin, all the skin, is washed frequently with a sponge or other means. Every morning is best, after which the skin should be rubbed very well with a rough cloth. This is the most certain way of preventing cold, and a little substitute for exercise, as it brings blood to the surface, and causes it to circulate well through the fine capillary vessels. Labor produces this circulation naturally. The insensible perspiration cannot escape well if the skin is not clean, as the pores get choked up. It is said that in health about half the aliment we take passes out through the skin. 2690, The Tomato Medicinal To many persons there is something unpleasant, not to say offensive, in the flavor of this excellent fruit. It has, however, long been used for culinary purposes in various countries of Europe. Dar. Bennett, a professor of some celebrity, considers it an invaluable article of diet, and ascribes to it very important medicinal properties. He declares, 1. That the tomato is one of the most powerful deobstruents of the Materia Medica. And that, in all those affections of the liver and other organs where calomel is indicated, it is probably the most effective and least harmful remedial agent known in the profession. 2. That a chemical extract can be obtained from it, which will altogether supersede the use of calomel in the cure of diseases. 3. That he has successfully treated diarrhea with this article alone. 4. That when used as an article of diet, it is almost a sovereign remedy for dyspepsia and indigestion. 2691. Warm Water. Warm water is preferable to cold water, as a drink, to persons who are subject to dyspeptic and bilious complaints, and it may be taken more freely than cold water, and consequently answers better as a diluent for carrying off bile. And removing obstructions in the urinary secretion, in cases of stone and gravel. When water of a temperature equal to that of the human body is used for drink, it proves considerably stimulant, and is particularly suited to dyspeptic, bilious, gouty, and chlorotic subjects. 
2692, Cautions in Visiting Sick Rooms Never venture into a sick room if you are in a violent perspiration, if circumstances require your continuance there, for the moment your body becomes cold, it is in a state likely to absorb the infection, and give you the disease. Nor visit a sick person, especially if the complaint be of a contagious nature, with an empty stomach, as this disposes the system more readily to receive the contagion. In attending a sick person, place yourself where the air passes from the door or window to the bed of the diseased, not betwixt the diseased person and any fire that is in the room. As the heat of the fire will draw the infectious vapor in that direction, and you would run much danger from breathing it. 2693 Necessity of good ventilation in rooms lighted with gas. In dwelling houses lighted by gas, the frequent renewal of the air is of great importance. A single gas burner will consume more oxygen, and produce more carbonic acid to deteriorate the atmosphere of a room, than six or eight candles. If, therefore, when several burners are used, no provision is made for the escape of the corrupted air and for the introduction of pure air from without, the health will necessarily suffer. Legal Memoranda Chapter 44 2694 Humorists tell us there is no act of our lives which can be performed without breaking through some one of the many meshes of the law by which our rights are so carefully guarded. And those learned in the law, when they do give advice without the usual fee, and in the confidence of friendship, generally say, pay, pay anything rather than go to law. While those having experience in the courts of Themis have a wholesome dread of its pitfalls. There are a few exceptions, however, to this fear of the law's uncertainties. And we hear of those to whom a lawsuit is on agreeable relaxation, a gentle excitement. One of this class, when remonstrated with, retorted, that while one friend kept dogs, and another horses, he, as he had a right to do, kept a lawyer. And no one had a right to dispute his taste. We cannot pretend, in these few pages, to lay down even the principles of law, not to speak of its contrary exposition in different courts. But there are a few acts of legal import which all men, and women too, must perform, and to these acts we may be useful in giving a right direction. There is a house to be leased or purchased, servants to be engaged, a will to be made, or property settled, in all families, and much of the welfare of its members depends on these things being done in proper legal form. 2695. Purchasing a House. Few men will venture to purchase a freehold, or even a leasehold property, by private contract, without making themselves acquainted with the locality, and employing a solicitor to examine the titles. But many do walk into an auction room, and bid for a property upon the representations of the auctioneer. The conditions, whatever they are, will bind him. For by one of the legal fictions of which we have still so many, the auctioneer, who is in reality the agent for the vendor, becomes also the agent for the buyer, and by putting down the names of bidders and the biddings. He binds him to whom the lot is knocked down to the sale and the conditions, the falling of the auctioneer's hammer is the acceptance of the offer, which completes the agreement to purchase. In any such transaction you can only look at the written or printed particulars. Any verbal statement of the auctioneer, made at the time of the sale, cannot contradict them, and they are implemented by the agreement, which the auctioneer calls on the purchaser to sign after the sale. You should sign no such contract without having a duplicate of it signed by the auctioneer, and delivered to you. It is, perhaps, unnecessary to add, that no trustee or assignee can purchase property for himself included in the trust, even at auction. Nor is it safe to pay the purchase money to an agent of the vendor, unless he give a written authority to the agent to receive it, besides handing over the requisite deeds and receipts. 2696 the laws of purchase and sale of property are so complicated that Lord Street Lennox devotes five chapters of his book on property law to the subject. The only circumstances strong enough to vitiate a purchase, which has been reduced to a written contract, is proof of fraudulent representation as to an encumbrance of which the buyer was ignorant, or a defect in title. But every circumstance which the purchaser might have learned by careful investigation, the law presumes that he did know. Thus, in buying a leasehold estate or house, all the covenants of the original lease are presumed to be known. 
It is not unusual, says Lord St. Leonards, to stipulate, in conditions of sale of leasehold property, that the production of a receipt for the last year's rent shall be accepted as proof that all the lessor's covenants were performed up to that period. Never bid for one clogged with such a condition. There are some acts against which no relief can be obtained, for example, the tenant's right to insure, or his insuring in an office or in names not authorized in the lease. And you should not rely upon the mere fact of the insurance being correct at the time of sale, there may have been a prior breach of covenant, and the landlord may not have waived his right of entry for the forfeiture. And where any doubt of this kind exists, the landlord should be appealed to. 2697. Interest on a purchase is due from the day fixed upon for completing, where it cannot be completed, the loss rests with the party with whom the delay rests. But it appears, when the delay rests with the seller, and the money is lying idle, notice of that is to be given to the seller to make him liable to the loss of interest. In law, the property belongs to the purchaser from the date of the contract. He is entitled to any benefit, and must bear any loss, the seller may suffer the insurance to drop without giving notice, and should a fire take place, the loss falls on the buyer. In agreeing to buy a house, therefore, provide at the same time for its insurance. Common fixtures pass with the house, where nothing is said about them. 2698. There are some well-recognized laws, of what may be called good neighborhood, which affect all properties. If you purchase a field or house, the seller retaining another field between yours and the highway, he must of necessity grant you a right of way. Where the owner of more than one house sells one of them, the purchaser is entitled to benefit by all drains leading from his house into other drains, and will be subject to all necessary drains for the adjoining houses. Although there is no express reservation as to drains. Thus, if his happens to be a leading drain, other necessary drains may be opened into it. In purchasing land for building on, you should expressly reserve a right to make an opening into any sewer or watercourse on the vendor's land for drainage purposes. 2699. Constructions. Among the cautions which purchasers of houses, land, or leaseholds, should keep in view, is a not inconsiderable array of constructive notices, which are equally binding with actual ones. Notice to your attorney or agent is notice to you. And when the same attorney is employed by both parties, and he is aware of an encumbrance of which you are ignorant, you are bound by it. Even where the vendor is guilty of a fraud to which your agent is privy, you are responsible, and cannot be released from the consequences. 2700. The relations of landlord and tenant are most important to both parties, and each should clearly understand his position. The proprietor of a house, or house and land, agrees to let it either to a tenant at will, a yearly tenancy, or under lease. A tenancy at will may be created by parole or by agreement, and as the tenant may be turned out when his landlord pleases, so he may leave when he himself thinks proper, but this kind of tenancy is extremely inconvenient to both parties. Where an annual rent is attached to the tenancy, in construction of law, a lease or agreement without limitation to any certain period is a lease from year to year. And both landlord and tenant are entitled to notice before the tenancy can be determined by the other. This notice must be given at least six months before the expiration of the current year of the tenancy, and it can only terminate at the end of any whole year from the time at which it began. So that the tenant entering into possession at midsummer, the notice must be given to or by him, so as to terminate at the same term. When once he is in possession, he has a right to remain for a whole year. And if no notice be given at the end of the first half year of his tenancy, he will have to remain two years, and so on for any number of years. 2701. Tenancy by Sufferance. This is a tenancy, not very uncommon, arising out of the unwillingness of either party to take the initiative in a more decided course at the expiry of a lease or agreement. The tenant remains in possession and continues to pay rent as before and becomes, from sufferance, a tenant from year to year. Which can only be terminated by one party or the other giving the necessary six months notice to quit at the term corresponding with the commencement of the original tenancy. This tenancy at sufferance applies also to an under-tenant, who remains in possession and pays rent to the reversioner or head landlord. 
a six months notice will be insufficient for this tenancy. A notice was given, in Wright v. Darby, ITR. 159, to quit a house held by plaintiff as tenant from year to year, on the June 17, 1840, requiring him to quit the premises on the October 11 following, or such other day as his said tenancy might expire. The tenancy had commenced on the October 11th in a former year, but it was held that this was not a good notice for the year ending October 11, 1841. A tenant from year to year gave his landlord notice to quit, ending the tenancy at a time within the half year, the landlord acquiesced at first, but afterwards refused to accept the notice. The tenant quitted the premises. The landlord entered, and even made some repairs, but it was afterwards held that the tenancy was not determined. A notice to quit must be such as the tenant may safely act on at the time of receiving it. Therefore it can only be given by an agent properly authorized at the time, and cannot be made good by the landlord adopting it afterwards. An unqualified notice, given at the proper time, should conclude with, on failure whereof, I shall require you to pay me double the former rent for so long as you retain possession. 2702. Leases. A lease is an instrument in writing, by which one person grants to another the occupation and use of lands or tenements for a term of years for a consideration, the lessor granting the lease, and the lessee accepting it with all its conditions. A lessor may grant the lease for any term less than his own interest. A tenant for life in an estate can only grant a lease for his own life. A tenant for life, having power to grant a lease, should grant it only in the terms of the power, otherwise the lease is void, and his estate may be made to pay heavy penalties under the covenant, usually the only one onerous on the lessor. For quiet enjoyment. The proprietor of a freehold, that is, of the possession in perpetuity of lands or tenements, may grant a lease for 999 years, for 99 years, or for 3 years. In the latter case, the lease may be either verbal or in writing, no particular form and no stamps being necessary, except the usual stamp on agreements. So long as the intention of the parties is clearly expressed, and the covenants definite, and well understood by each party, the agreement is complete, and the law satisfied. In the case of settled estates, the Court of Chancery is empowered to authorize leases under the 19 and 20 Vict. C. 120, and 21 and 22 Vict. C. 77, as follows. 21 years for agriculture or occupation. 40 years for water power. 99 years for building leases. 60 years for repairing leases. 2703, the lessor may also grant an underlease for a term less than his own, to grant the whole of his term would be an assignment. Leases are frequently burdened with a covenant not to underlet without the consent of the landlord, this is a covenant sometimes very onerous, and to be avoided, where it is possible, by a prudent lessee. 2704. A lease for any term beyond three years, whether an actual lease or an agreement for one, must be in the form of a deed, that is, it must be under seal. And all assignments and surrenders of leases must be in the same form, or they are void at law. Thus an agreement made by letter, or by a memorandum of agreement, which would be binding in most cases, would be valueless when it was for a lease, unless witnessed, and given under hand and seal. The last statute, 8 and 9 Vict. c. 106, under which these precautions became necessary, has led to serious difficulties. The judges, says Lord Esty. Leonards, feel the difficulty of holding a lease in writing, but not by deed, to be altogether void, and consequently decided, that although such a lease is void under the statute, yet it so far regulates the holding. That it creates a tenancy from year to year, terminable by half a year's notice. And if the tenure endure for the term attempted to be created by the void lease, the tenant may be evicted at the end of the term without any notice to quit. An agreement for a lease not by deed has been construed to be a lease for a term of years, and consequently void under the statute, and yet, says Lord St. Leonard's, a court of equity has held that it may be specifically enforced as an agreement upon the terms stated. The law on this point is one of glorious uncertainty. In making any such agreement, therefore, 
we should be careful to express that it is an agreement, and not a lease, and that it is witnessed and under seal. 2705, Agreements. It is usual, where the lease is a repairing one, to agree for a lease to be granted on completion of repairs according to specification. This agreement should contain the names and designation of the parties, a description of the property, and the term of the intended lease, and all the covenants which are to be inserted, as no verbal agreement can be made to a written agreement. It should also declare that the instrument is an agreement for a lease, and not the lease itself. The points to be settled in such an agreement are, the rent, term, and especially covenants for insuring and rebuilding in the event of a fire. And if it is intended that the lessor's consent is to be obtained before assigning or underleasing, a covenant to that effect is required in the agreement. In building leases, usually granted for 99 years, the tenant is to insure the property. And even where the agreement is silent on that point, the law decides it so. It is otherwise with ordinary tenements, when the tenant pays a full, or what the law terms rack rent. The landlord is then to insure, unless it is otherwise arranged by the agreement. 2706, it is important for lessee, and lessor, also, that the latter does not exceed his powers. A lease granted by a tenant for life before he is properly in possession, is void in law, for, although a court of equity, according to Lord Esti, Leonard's will, by force of its own jurisdiction, support a bona fide lease, granted under a power which is merely erroneous in form or ceremonies, and the 12 and 13 Vict. C. 26, and 13 and 14 Vict. C. 19, compel a new lease to be granted with the necessary variations, while the lessor has no power to compel him to accept such a lease, except when the person in remainder is competent and willing to confirm the original lease without variations. Yet all these difficulties involve both delay, costs, and anxieties. 2707, in husbandry leases, a covenant to cultivate the land in a husbandlike manner, and according to the custom of the district, is always implied, but it is more usual to prescribe the course of tillage which is to be pursued. In the case of houses for occupation, the tenant would have to keep the house in a tenantable state of repair during the term, and deliver it up in like condition. This is not the case with the tenant at will, or from year to year, where the landlord has to keep the house in tenantable repair, and the tenant is only liable for waste beyond reasonable wear and tear. 2708, Insurance. Every lease, or agreement for a lease, should covenant not only who is to pay insurance, but how the tenement is to be rebuilt in the event of a fire. For if the house were burnt down, and no provision made for insurance, the tenant, supposing there was the ordinary covenant to repair in the lease, would not only have to rebuild, but to pay rent while it was being rebuilt. More than this, supposing, under the same lease, the landlord had taken the precaution of insuring, he is not compelled to lay out the money recovered in rebuilding the premises. Sir John Leach lays it down, that, the tenant's situation could not be changed by a precaution, on the part of the landlord, with which he had nothing to do. This decision Lord Campbell confirmed in a more recent case, in which an action was brought against a lessee who was not bound to repair, and neither he nor the landlord bound to insure. Admitting an equitable defense, the court affirmed Sir John Leach's decision, holding that the tenant was bound to pay the rent, and could not require the landlord to lay out the insurance money in rebuilding. This is opposed to the opinion of Lord Street Lennards, who admits, however, that the decision of the court must overrule his dictum. Such being the state of the law, it is very important that insurance should be provided for, and that the payment of rent should be made to depend upon rebuilding the house in the event of a fire. Care must be taken, however, that this is made a covenant of the lease, as well as in the agreement, otherwise the tenant must rebuild the house. 2709 the law declares that a tenant is not bound to repair damages by tempest, lightning, or other natural casualty, unless there is a special covenant to that effect in the lease. But if there is a general covenant to repair, the repair will fall upon the tenant. Lord Kenyon lays it down, in the case of a bridge destroyed by a flood, the tenant being under a general covenant to repair, that, where a party, by his own contract, creates a duty or charge upon himself, he is bound to make it good. 
because he might have guarded against it in the contract. The same principle of law has been applied to a house destroyed by lightning. It is, therefore, important to have this settled in the insurance clause. 2710, Lord St. Leonards asserts that his policies against fire are not so framed as to render the company legally liable. Generally the property is inaccurately described with reference to the conditions under which you insure. They are framed by companies who, probably, are not unwilling to have a legal defense against any claim, as they intend to pay what they deem just claim without taking advantage of any technical objection. And intending to make use of their defense only against what they believe to be a fraud, although they may not be able to prove it. But, says his lordship, do not rely upon the moral feelings of the directors. Ascertain that your house falls strictly within the conditions. Even having the surveyor of the company to look over your house before the insurance will not save you, unless your policy is correct. This is true, but probably his lordship's legal jealousy overshoots the mark here. Assurance companies only require an honest statement of the facts, and that no concealment is practiced with their surveyor. And the case of his own, which he quotes, in which a glass door led into a conservatory, rendering it, according to the view of the company, hazardous, and consequently voiding the policy, when a fire did occur, the company paid. Rather than try the question. But even after the fire they demurred, when called upon, to make the description correct and endorse on the policy the fact that the drawing room opened through a glass door into conservatories. One of two inferences is obvious here. Either his lordship has overcolored the statement, or the company could not be the respectable one represented. The practice with all reputable offices is to survey the premises before insurance, and to describe them as they appear. But no concealment of stoves, or other dangerous accessories or inflammable goods, should be practiced. This certainly binds the office so long as no change takes place. But the addition of any stove, opening, or door through a party wall, the introduction of gunpowder, saltpetry, or other inflammable articles into the premises without notice, very properly, voids the policy. The usual course is to give notice of all alterations, and have them endorse on the policy, as additions to the description of the property, there is little fear, where this is honestly done. That any company would adopt the sharp practice hinted at in Lord St. Leonard's excellent handy book. 2711, Breaks in the Lease. Where a lease is for 7, 14, or 21 years, the option to determine it at the end of the first term is in the tenant, unless it is distinctly agreed that the option shall be mutual, according to Lord Street Lennox. 2712. Noxious Trades. A clause is usually introduced prohibiting the carrying on of any trade in some houses, and of noxious or particular trades in others. This clause should be jealously inspected, otherwise great annoyance may be produced. It has been held that a general clause of this description prohibited a tenant from keeping a school, for which he had taken it, although a lunatic asylum and public house have been found admissible. The keeping an asylum not being deemed a trade, which is defined as, conducted by buying and selling. It is better to have the trades, or class of trades objected to, defined in the lease. 2713, Fixtures. In houses held under lease, it has been the practice with landlords to lease the bare walls of the tenement only, leaving the lessee to put in the stoves, cupboards, and such other conveniences as he requires, at his own option. Those, except under particular circumstances, are the property of the lessee, and may either be sold to an incoming tenant, or removed at the end of his term. The articles which may not be removed are subject to considerable doubt, and are a fruitful source of dispute. Mr. Commissioner Von Blank has defined as tenant's property all goods and chattels. 2. NDLY, all articles slightly connected one with another, and with the freehold, but capable of being separated without materially injuring the freehold. 3. RDLY, articles fixed to the freehold by nails and screws, bolts or pegs, are also tenant's goods and chattels, but when sunk in the soil, or built on it, they are integral parts of the freehold, and cannot be removed. Thus, a greenhouse or conservatory attached to the house by the tenant is not removable, 
but the furnace and hot water pipes by which it is heated, may be removed or sold to the incoming tenant. A brick flue does not come under the same category, but remains. Window blinds, grates, stoves, coffee mills, and, in a general sense, everything he has placed which can be removed without injury to the freehold, he may remove, if they are separated from the tenement during his term, and the place made good. It is not unusual to leave the fixtures in their place, with an undertaking from the landlord that, when again let, the incoming tenant shall pay for them or permit their removal. In a recent case, however, a tenant having held over beyond his term and not removed his fixtures, the landlord let the premises to a new tenant, who entered into possession, and would not allow the fixtures to be removed, it was held by the courts. On trial, that he was justified. A similar case occurred to the writer, he left his fixtures in the house, taking a letter from the landlord, undertaking that the incoming tenant should pay for them by valuation, or permit their removal. The house was let, the landlord died. His executors, on being applied to, pleaded ignorance, as did the tenant, and on being furnished with a copy of the letter, the executors told applicant that if he was aggrieved, he knew his remedy, namely, an action at law. He thought the first lost the least, and has not altered his opinion. 2714, Taxes. Land tax, sewers rate, and property tax, are landlord's taxes, but by 30 GO2. C. 2. The occupier is required to pay all rates levied, and deduct from the rent such taxes as belong to the landlord. Many landlords now insert a covenant, stipulating that land tax and sewers rate are to be paid by the tenants, and not deducted, this does not apply to the property tax. All other taxes and rates are payable by the occupier. 2715. Water rate, of course, is paid by the tenant. The water companies, as well as gas companies, have the power of cutting off the supply, and most of them have also the right of distraining, in the same manner as landlords have for rent. 2716. Notice to quit. In the case of leasing for a term, no notice is necessary, the tenant quits, as a matter of course, at its termination. Or if, by tacit consent, he remains paying rent as heretofore, he becomes a tenant at sufferance, or from year to year. Half a year's notice now becomes necessary, as we have already seen, to terminate the tenancy. Except in London, and the rent is under 40 shillings, when a quarter's notice is sufficient. Either of these notices may be given verbally, if it can be proved that the notice was definite, and given at the right time. Form of notice is quite immaterial, provided it is definite and clear in its purport. 2717, tenancy for less than a year may be terminated according to the taking. Thus, when taken for three months, a three months notice is required. When monthly, a month's notice, and when weekly, a week's notice, but weekly tenancy is changed to a quarterly tenure if the rent is allowed to stand over for three months. When taken for a definite time, as a month, a week, or a quarter, no notice is necessary on either side. 2718, Dilapidations. At the termination of a lease, supposing he has not done so before, a landlord can, and usually does, send a surveyor to report upon the condition of the tenement, and it becomes his duty to ferret out every defect. A litigious landlord may drag the outgoing tenant into an expensive lawsuit, which he has no power to prevent. He may even compel him to pay for repairing improvements which he has effected in the tenement itself, if dilapidations exist. When the lessor covenants to do all repairs, and fails to do so, the lessee may repair, and deduct the cost from the rent. 2719, Recovery of Rent. The remedies placed in the hands of landlords are very stringent. The day after rent falls due, he may proceed to recover it, by action at law, by distress on the premises, or by action of ejectment, if the rent is half a year in arrear. Distress is the remedy usually applied, the landlord being authorized to enter the premises, seize the goods and chattels of his tenant, and sell them, on the fifth day, to reimburse himself for all arrears of rent and the charges of the distress. There are a few exceptions, but, generally, all goods found on the premises may be seized. The exceptions are, 
dogs, rabbits, poultry, fish, tools and implements of a man's trade actually in use, the books of a scholar, the axe of a carpenter, wearing apparel on the person, a horse at the plow, or a horse he may be riding. A watch in the pocket, loose money, deeds, writings, the cattle at a smithy forge, corn sent to a mill for grinding, cattle and goods of a guest at an inn. But, curiously enough, carriages and horses standing at livery at the same inn may be taken. Distress can only be levied in the daytime, and if made after the tender of arrears, it is illegal. If tender is made after the distress, but before it is impounded, the landlord must abandon the distress and bear the cost himself. Nothing of a perishable nature, which cannot be restored in the same condition, as milk, fruit, and the like, must be taken. 2720. The law does not regard a day as consisting of portions. The popular notion that a notice to quit should be served before noon is an error. Although distraint is one of the remedies, it is seldom advisable in a landlord to resort to distraining for the recovery of rent. If a tenant cannot pay his rent, the sooner he leaves the premises the better. If he be a rogue and won't pay, he will probably know that nine out of ten distresses are illegal, through the carelessness, ignorance, or extortion of the brokers who execute them. Many, if not most, of the respectable brokers will not execute distresses, and the business falls into the hands of persons whom it is by no means desirable to employ. 2721. Powers to relieve landlords of premises, by giving them legal possession, are given by 19 and 20 Vict, Cap. 108, to the county courts, in cases where the rent does not exceed fifty pounds per annum, and under the circumstances hereinafter mentioned, i.e. 1. Where the term has expired, or been determined by notice to quit. 2. Where there is one half year's rent in arrear, and the landlord shall have right by law to enter for the non-payment thereof. As proof of this power is required, the importance of including such a power in the agreement for tenancy will be obvious. In the county courts the amount of rent due may be claimed, as well as the possession of the premises, in one summons. 2722. When a tenant deserts premises, leaving one half year's rent in arrear, possession may be recovered by means of the police court. The rent must not exceed twenty pounds per annum, and must be at least three-fourths of the value of the premises. In cases in which the tenant has not deserted the premises, and where notice to quit has been given and has expired, the landlord must give notice to the tenant of his intended application. The annual rent in this case, also, must not exceed £20. 2723, the I, O, U, the law is not particular as to orthography, in fact, it distinctly refuses to recognize the existence of that delightful science. You may bring your action against Mr. Jacob Phillips, under the fanciful denomination of Jacob Phillips, if you like, and the law won't care, because the law goes by year. And, although it insists upon having everything written, things written are only supposed in law to have any meaning when read, which is, after all, a common sense rule enough. So, instead of, I owe you, persons of a cheerful disposition, so frequently found connected with debt, used to write facetiously I owe you and the law approved of their so doing. An I, O, U. Is nothing more than a written admission of a debt, and may run thus. October 15, 1860. To Mr. W. Brown. I, O, U, ten pounds for coals. Ten pounds. John Jones. If to this you add the time of payment, as, payable in one month from this date, your I, O, U is worthless and illegal, for it thus ceases to be a mere acknowledgement, and becomes a promissory note. Now a promissory note requires a stamp which an I, O, U, does not. Many persons, nevertheless, stick penny stamps upon them, probably for ornamental effect, or to make them look serious and authoritative. If for the former purpose, the postage stamp looks better than the receipt stamp upon blue paper. If you are W. Brown, and you didn't see the I, O, U, signed, and can't find anybody who knows Jones's autograph, and Jones won't pay, the I, O, U, will be of no use to you in the county court, except to make the judge laugh. 
He will, however, allow you to prove the consideration, and as, of course, you won't be prepared to do anything of the sort, he will, if you ask him politely, adjourn the hearing for a week. When you can produce the coalhevers who delivered the article, and thus gain a glorious victory. 2724, Apprentices. By the Statute 5 Elise. Cap. 4. It is enacted that, in cases of ill usage by masters towards apprentices, or of neglect of duty by apprentices, the complaining party may apply to a justice of the peace, who may make such order as equity may require. If, for want of conformity on the part of the master, this cannot be done, then the master may be bound to appear at the next sessions. Authority is given by the Act to the justices in sessions to discharge the apprentice from his indentures. They are also empowered, on proof of misbehavior of the apprentice, to order him to be corrected or imprisoned with hard labor. 2725, Husband and Wife. Contrary to the vulgar opinion, second cousins, as well as first, may legally marry. When married, a husband is liable for his wife's debts contracted before marriage. A creditor desirous of suing for such a claim should proceed against both. It will, however, be sufficient if the husband be served with process, the names of both appearing therein, thus, John Jones and and his wife. A married woman, if sued alone, may plead her marriage, or, as it is called in law, coverture. The husband is liable for debts of his wife contracted for necessaries while living with him. If she voluntarily leaves his protection, this liability ceases. He is also liable for any debts contracted by her with his authority. If the husband have abjured the realm, or been transported by a sentence of law, the wife is liable during his absence, as if she were a single woman, for debts contracted by her. 2726. In civil cases, a wife may now give evidence on behalf of her husband in criminal cases she can neither be a witness for or against her husband. The case of assault by him upon her forms an exception to this rule. 2727. The law does not at this day admit the ancient principle of allowing moderate correction by a husband upon the person of his wife. Although this is said to have been anciently limited to the use of a stick not bigger than the thumb, this barbarity is now altogether exploded. He may, notwithstanding, as has been recently shown in the famous Agapemon case, keep her under restraint, to prevent her leaving him, provided this be effected without cruelty. 2728. By the Divorce and Matrimonial Causes Act, 1857, a wife deserted by her husband may apply to a magistrate, or to the petty sessions, for an order to protect her lawful earnings or property acquired by her after such desertion. From her husband and his creditors. In this case it is indispensable that such order shall, within ten days, be entered at the county court of the district within which she resides. It will be seen that the basis of an application for such an order is desertion. Consequently, where the parties have separated by common consent, such an order cannot be obtained, any previous cruelty or misconduct on the husband's part notwithstanding. 2729. When a husband allows his wife to invest money in her own name in a savings bank, and he survives her, it is sometimes the rule of such establishments to compel him to take out administration in order to receive such money. Although it is questionable whether such rule is legally justifiable. Widows and widowers pay no legacy duty for property coming to them through their deceased partners. 2730, receipts for sums above two pounds should now be given upon penny stamps. A bill of exchange may nevertheless be discharged by an endorsement stating that it has been paid, and this will not be liable to the stamp. A receipt is not, as commonly supposed, conclusive evidence as to a payment. It is only what the law terms prima facie evidence, that is, good until contradicted or explained. Thus, if A sends wares or merchandise to B, with a receipt, as a hint that the transaction is intended to be for ready money, and B detain the receipt without paying the cash, or will be at liberty to prove the circumstances and to recover his claim. The evidence to rebut the receipt must, however, be clear and indubitable, as, after all, written evidence is of a stronger nature than oral testimony. 2731, Books of Account. 
A tradesman's books of account cannot be received as evidence in his own behalf, unless the entries therein be proved to have been brought under the notice of, and admitted to be correct by the other party. As is commonly the case with the pass books employed backwards and forwards between bakers, butchers, and the like domestic traders, and their customers. The defendant may, however, compel the tradesman to produce his books to show entries adverse to his own claim. 2732, Wills. The last proof of affection which we can give to those left behind, is to leave their worldly affairs in such a state as to excite neither jealousy, nor anger, nor heartrendings of any kind, at least for the immediate future. This can only be done by a just, clear, and intelligible disposal of whatever there is to leave. Without being advocates for every man being his own lawyer, it is not to be denied that the most elaborately prepared wills have been the most fruitful sources of litigation. And it has even happened that learned judges left wills behind them which could not be carried out. Except in cases where the property is in land or in leases of complicated tenure, very elaborate details are unnecessary, and we counsel no man to use words in making his will of which he does not perfectly understand the meaning and import. 2733. All men over twenty-one years of age, and of sound mind, and all unmarried women of like age and sanity, may by will bequeath their property to whom they please. Infants, that is, all persons under twenty-one years of age, and married women, except where they have an estate to their own separate use, are incapacitated, without the concurrence of the husband. The law taking the disposal of any property they die possessed of. A person born deaf and dumb cannot make a will, unless there is evidence that he could read and comprehend its contents. A person convicted of felony cannot make a will, unless subsequently pardoned, neither can persons outlawed, but the wife of a felon transported for life may make a will, and act in all respects as if she were unmarried. A suicide may bequeath real estate, but personal property is forfeited to the crown. 2734, except in the case of soldiers on actual service, and sailors at sea, every will must be made in writing. It must be signed by the testator, or by some other person in his presence, and at his request, and the signature must be made or acknowledged in the presence of two or more witnesses, who are required to be present at the same time. Who declare by signing that the will was signed by the testator, or acknowledged in their presence, and that they signed as witnesses in testator's presence. 2735, by the Act of 1852 it was enacted that no will shall be valid unless signed at the foot or end thereof by the testator, or by some person in his presence, and by his direction. But a subsequent act proceeds to say that every will shall, as far only as regards the position of the signature of the testator, or of the person signing for him, be deemed valid if the signature shall be so placed at, or after, or following, or under, or beside, or opposite to the end of the will, that it shall be apparent on the face of it that the testator intended to give it effect by such signature. Under this clause, a will of several sheets, all of which were duly signed, except the last one, has been refused probate. While, on the other hand, a similar document has been admitted to probate where the last sheet only, and none of the other sheets, was signed. In order to be perfectly formal, however, each separate sheet should be numbered, signed, and witnessed, and attested on the last sheet. This witnessing is an important act, the witnesses must subscribe it in the presence of the testator and of each other, and by their signature they testify to having witnessed the signature of the testator, he being in sound mind at the time. Wills made under any kind of coercion, or even importunity may become void, being contrary to the wishes of the testator. Fraud or imposition also renders a will void, and where two wills made by the same person happen to exist, neither of them dated, the maker of the wills is declared to have died intestate. 2736. A will may always be revoked and annulled, but only by burning or entirely destroying the writing, or by adding a codicil, or making a subsequent will duly attested. But as the alteration of a will is only a revocation to the extent of the alteration, if it is intended to revoke the original will entirely, such intention should be declared, no merely verbal directions can revoke a written will. And the act of running the pen through the signatures, or down the page, is not sufficient to cancel it, without a written declaration to that effect signed and witnessed. 
2737, A will made before marriage is revoked thereby. 2738. A codicil is a supplement or addition to a will either explaining or altering former dispositions, it may be written on the same or separate paper, and is to be witnessed and attested in the same manner as the original document. 2739, Witnesses. Any persons are qualified to witness a will who can write their names, but such witness cannot be benefited by the will. If a legacy is granted to the persons witnessing, it is void. The same rule applies to the husband or wife of a witness. A bequest made to either of these is void. 2740, Form of Wills. Form is unimportant, provided the testator's intention is clear. It should commence with his designation, that is, his name and surname, place of abode, profession, or occupation. The legatee should also be clearly described. In leaving a legacy to a married woman, if no trustees are appointed over it, and no specific directions given, that it is for her sole and separate use, free from the control, debts, and encumbrances of her husband. The husband will be entitled to the legacy. In the same manner a legacy to an unmarried woman will vest in her husband after marriage, unless a settlement of it is made on her before marriage. 2741. In sudden emergencies a form may be useful, and the following has been considered a good one for a deathbed will, where the assistance of a solicitor could not be obtained. Indeed, few solicitors can prepare a will on the spur of the moment, they require time and legal forms, which are by no means necessary, before they can act. I, A, B, of No. 10, Street, in the city of, gentleman, builder, or grocer, as the case may be, being of sound mind, thus publish and declare my last will and testament. Revoking and annulling all former dispositions of my property, I give and bequeath as follows, to my son J. B., of, I give and bequeath the sum of, dash, to my daughter M., the wife of J. Of, I give and bequeath the sum of, if intended for her own use, add, to her sole and separate use, free from the control, debts, and encumbrances of her husband both in addition to any sum or sums of money or other property they have before had from me. All the remaining property I die possessed of I leave to my dear wife M. B., for her sole and separate use during her natural life, together with my house and furniture, situate at number 10, street, aforesaid. At her death, I desire that the said house shall be sold, with all the goods and chattels therein, or, I give and bequeath the said house, with all the goods and chattels therein, to, and the money realized from the sale. Together with that in which my said wife had a life interest, I give and bequeath in equal moieties to my son and daughter before named. I appoint my dear friend T. S., of, and T. B., of, together with my wife M. B., as executors to this my last will and testament. Signed by A. B. This tenth day of October, 1861, in our presence, both being present together, and both having signed as witnesses, in the presence of the testator, A. B. T. S., Witness. F. M., Witness. It is to be observed that the signature of the testator after this attestation has been signed by the witnesses, is not a compliance with the act, he must sign first. 2742, Stamp Duties. In the case of persons dying intestate, when their effects are administered to by their family, the stamp duty is half as much more as it would have been under a will. Freehold and copyhold estates are now subject to a special impost on passing, by the Stamp Act of 1857. 2743, the legacy duty only commences when it amounts to twenty pounds and upwards. And where it is not directed otherwise, the duty is deducted from the legacy. 2744, you cannot compound for past absence of charity by bequeathing land or tenements, or money to purchase such, to any charitable use, by your last will and testament. But you may devise them to the British Museum, to either of the two universities of Oxford and Cambridge, to Eton, Winchester, and Westminster, and you may, if so inclined, leave it for the augmentation of Queen Anne's bounty. You may, however, Order your executors to sell land and hand over the money received to any charitable institution. 2745. In making provision for a wife, 
state whether it is in lieu of, or in addition to, dower. 2746. If you have advanced money to any child, and taken an acknowledgement for it, or entered it in any book of account, you should declare whether any legacy left by will is in addition to such advance, or whether it is to be deducted from the legacy. 2747. A legacy left by will to anyone would be cancelled by your leaving another legacy by a codicil to the same person, unless it is stated to be in addition to the former bequest. 2748. Your entire estate is chargeable with your debts, except where the real estate is settled. Let it be distinctly stated out of which property, the real or personal, they are paid, where it consists of both. 2749. Whatever is devised, let the intention be clearly expressed, and without any condition, if you intend it to take effect. 2750. Attestation is not necessary to a will, as the act of witnessing is all the law requires, and the will itself declares the testator to be of sound mind in his own estimation. But, wherever there are erasures or interlineations, one becomes necessary. No particular form is prescribed. But it should state that the testator either signed it himself, or that another signed it by his request, or that he acknowledged the signature to be his in their presence, both being present together, and signed as witnesses in his presence. When there are erasures, the attestation must declare that, the words interlined in the third line of page 4, and the erasure in the fifth line of page 6, having been first made. These are the acts necessary to make a properly executed will. And, being simple in themselves and easily performed, they should be strictly complied with, and always attested. 2751, a witness may, on being requested, sign for testator. And he may also sign for his fellow witness, supposing he can only make his mark, declaring that he does so, but a husband cannot sign for his wife either as testator or witness, nor can a wife for her husband. 2752-53. 